Welcome to Econ Roots, your podcast on the roots of economic thought. I'm Stefan. And I'm Otto. Let's get on with today's conversation. Today marks a milestone in the history of Econ Roots as a podcast. While we have already been blessed with guest appearances from some of the best economists in the field, today we have our first Nobel laureate, the esteemed Eric Stark Maskin. While we deal with Maskin's important contributions in a later, ordinary episode, we are very thankful to Maskin and Copenhagen Business School for awarding us time together during his spring 2003 visit. Maskin is an American economist and mathematician. He was jointly awarded the 2007 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences with Leonid Hurwicz and Roger Meyerson for having laid the foundations of mechanism design theory. He is the Adams University Professor and Professor of Economics and Mathematics at Harvard University. In today's challenging conversation, we'll talk about how institutions emerge and are designed, particularly inspired by mechanism design theory. From this, the conversation expands into important areas such as what do people know about their world and how do they view it? We also apply this to real-life topics such as financial market regulation and climate change. If you stay until the end, you might even learn how winning the Nobel Prize could land you a spot on live comedy. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, bonus episode of the third season of Econ Roots, your, his- your podcast on the history of economic thought. I'm extremely delighted and honored to have a special guest today, Nobel laureate Eric Mastin. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. So can you, for our listeners, explain mechanism design theory and its relevance to economics? Sure. Uh, mechanism design uh, is uh, economics in reverse. Uh, that's the way I like to describe it. In most of economics, we look at existing economic institutions such as markets, and we try to predict or explain the outcomes that those institutions will give rise to. Uh, and that's a very valuable activity, but in Uh, mechanism design, we reverse the direction. That is, we start with the outcomes. We say we we would like to have these particular outcomes. Can we work backwards to figure out what institutions or mechanisms we could create that will achieve those outcomes? Now, I'm speaking in generalities here. Uh, It might be useful for your listeners to have a little example. Please uh, imagine uh, that we have a, a cake that we want to divide between two children. Uh, and our goal as mechanism designers is to uh, divide the cake so that each child thinks that his or her piece is at least as big as the other one. Uh, So in other words, our goal is to achieve a fair division of the cake. Now the big question is, how do we do that? If we know how the children themselves see the cake, there's a very simple solution. Uh, We can just take a knife, cut the cake um, exactly in half, and and we're assuming that the children see the cake the same way we do. Yes. If they see the cake the same way way we do, we cut it in half, we give each child exactly uh, half the cake, from our point of view, uh, and if they see the cake the same way we do, they each think they have exactly half the cake, and so the the problem is solved. Uh, But in reality, it's entirely possible that the children, each child will see the cake differently from the way we do. In fact, that's 
probably what is going to happen, that they're going to see things differently. So uh, we might think we've cut the cake exactly at half, but one of the children will think that the other kid's piece is bigger. Um, so this, in a, in a very simple example, is the basic problem of mechanism design. We want to achieve a goal, in this case a fair division, but we don't have enough information to achieve that goal on our own because we don't, in this case, we don't know how the children see the cake. Uh, now, there's a very simple but very ingenious solution to the cake problem, which has been actually which has been known for thousands of years. So this is not a, a recent accomplishment, but uh, but it illustrates the how mechanism design can work. And the solution is uh, that we don't cut the cake ourselves. Instead, we give the knife to one of the children mm -hmm. and we have the first child cut the cake, but then the other child chooses which piece to take oh. for herself. Yeah. Uh, and this is called the divide and choose method. And it works because when the first child is cutting the cake, he will have the incentive of to cut it so that from his point of view, the two pieces are exactly equal. Why? Because if one of them is bigger, he knows the other child is going to take it and add one. So, so he's going to make sure that whichever piece the other child takes, he is happy with the one that remains. So he will be happy because from his point of view, the two pieces are equal. And the other child will be happy because she gets to choose her favorite piece. And so voila, voila. we have solved the, the problem. Uh, so that that's a very simple example, but it begins to uh, tell you how mechanism, how mechanism design works. The idea is to provide incentives for people to do what is good for society, in this case, achieve a fair division, even though we don't know everything about these people. All right, so it solves a lot of the private knowledge issues that I find that Hayek talks about and these kind of exactly. things, yes. But this also assumes a very strong sense of rationality among agents, right? It assumes some rationality, uh, not by no means perfect rationality. No. All, all, we, uh, all we really need to do and that for the cake example is to assume that in making choices, simple choices between which piece to take, people can make a choice which is best for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that doesn't necessarily involve a very elaborate calculation. Uh, we know that in reality, uh, people are not fully rational in the sense that they can do all possible computations. And in fact, we know from the work of Kahneman and Tversky and others that they might even make some systematic mistakes. Yep. However, uh, on a very general level, uh, people are rational up to the point where they do respond to incentives. So if I put a tax on some good, people are going to use less of that good. Yep. At, at, uh, they're rational up to a point, and, and up to a point where designing a mechanism can um, make use of that limited kind of rationality. So by that answer, you all 
already sort of answered my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Where's the limit between designing institutions and relying on evolution for institutional design? Because in the case example, I guess institution is the powers that be quite the knife, and then you have an evolutionary element among the agents, right? So is there a general limit to the sign of institutions? I think as a rule, we don't want to change institutions radically mm -hmm. uh, because first, we don't know exactly how people are going to react to the changes. And, and furthermore, we may not have enough information yeah, he, he, the boy would stab the girl with the knife, right? <laughs> That's right. So, so uh, I I am a strong believer in uh, evolutionary change. That is, make, making changes uh, to improve the system, but making each step a fairly small step, and then reevaluating after we see uh, how those small steps lead to changes in behavior. Um, I think um, that even for big problems, mm -hmm. uh, it's generally desirable to move slowly. So, so the, the biggest mechanism design problem we currently face is climate change. Mm -hmm. Climate change, uh, I think, most people will agree is currently the biggest existential threat mm -hmm. we face. Uh, there is a solution, uh, however. Uh, economists have known this solution for a long time, which is to make people uh, pay for the climate damage they do through a tax system. Yeah. Uh, we don't currently have an adequate tax system in place. Uh, what I would like to see happen, and, and uh, uh, I have at least some optimism that this will occur, is to gradually over time introduce the taxes that are necessary to make payment reflect damage done. Yeah. Uh, not to do it all at once, but to do it over a period of time so that people get used to the taxes and so that we can reevaluate what the taxes ought to be. A very sensible answer. Thank you very much. Um, but this is something that makes so much sense to economists. But when you start to explain this to non-economists, they have all sorts of, uh, um, uh, they can't understand that simple solution. I always find that interesting. So I love that you that you pinpointed it. Um, so going back to institutional design, is there an institutional fundamental trade-off between moral hazard and adverse selection? Uh, well, they, they are two they are two different problems. Oh, yeah. Uh, in what sense do you think that there is a trade-off? I think sometimes we invest, uh, we make institutions that might limit moral hazard, but then promote adverse selections, particularly in the public sector. So if we, uh, if we have very strict rules, but at the same time have budget constraints that make it impossible to do everything, obviously not. I think we can get rid of moral hazard to a degree, but then we get more adverse selection oftentimes. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I see what you're saying. Uh, let Let me give an example, please. I mean, um, banking, or or or, or, or actually more, more generally financial markets. Um, financial markets need to be regulated in order to work well. We, we, we saw up in the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009, what happens when markets are not properly regulated. Uh, once we
Well, that there are actually two two different kinds of interventions that that are needed. Uh, first, uh, if some financial institutions get into trouble. we may need to bail them out. Mm -hmm. Not so much for the sake of those institutions, but to make sure that there isn't a chain reaction and we, ha because this bank fails, the next bank fails, and that promotes more and more bank failures. Th this is what I would call uh, reacting to an adverse selection problem that the first bank to fail is the is the one which is uh, in most trouble we we bail it out to prevent other banks from getting into trouble too but by uh, by bailing banks out if they fail we are creating a moral hazard problem because now uh, banks might be more willing to take risks that they shouldn't take because they know that they'll be saved later on. So in addition to the adverse selection policy, we also need a moral hazard policy. We need to regulate what the banks do in the first place mm -hmm. so that they don't get into trouble. We need to impose capital requirements limitations on, on banks or that limit their leverage. Uh, a two-sided policy, which ex-ante takes care of moral hazard and ex-post takes care of adverse selection. But if you don't mind, I'd like to challenge that a little bit because uh, we see now in the financial sectors, many are complaining that they're core competences within their firms is turning more to be compliant than actually risk evaluation, right? Isn't there a risk of this, that if we over-regulate, the banks become bureaucracies rather than commercial actors actually evaluating risks? Wouldn't that be as you absolutely? Uh, just as too little regulation uh, leads to the system possibly blowing up, uh, too much regulation leads to stultification and 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 a uh, uh, and an absence of uh, of innovation uh, and you have to get the the balance right um, but getting the balance right is possible and 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 to illustrate that let me point to a period in the previous century uh, where we had both a, a, a remarkable absence of financial crises and at the same time a great deal of economic innovation and that was the period after the Great Depression mm -hmm. but before the deregulation of the 1980s. It was a period of almost uh, 50 years, mm -hmm. 40 to 50 years, where there was a fair amount of regulation which had been brought into place after the, the, the Great Depression, uh, which was caused by bank failures. Uh, and this regulation was successful, but no, no big financial crises. And yet we had a remarkable period of, of economic growth, at least uh, in Europe and in, in North America. So uh, get it. it's important to get the balance right, but it's not impossible to get the balance right. All right, so that's a perfect start to the next question. Why do you think mechanisms to disclose preferences for public good have been so little used in practice? Do politicians lack the right incentives nowadays? 
I, so there, there, there's a particular problem with public goods that doesn't arise with uh, with prime the good. Well, I, I actually, let me step back uh, and say there is a sense in which we do, in which we use mechanisms for public goods. Uh, and that is we hold elections. Oh, yeah, what, 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 when, when we vote for this politician or that politician, we are, at least in part, choosing between different public goods. Uh, and, and people participate in those mechanisms. Now, uh, you might ask, well, um, why don't we... Why don't we use um, a mechanism to decide how many road, public roads we're going to build? Uh, there, there exist mechanisms out there which uh, ostensibly uh, would um, would get would lead to the right number of roads being built. But there's a problem with those mechanisms, which is that they uh, may force some people to um, to pay Mm -hmm. more than they're getting in return. Uh, in economics language, uh, we are violating their individual rationality constraints. Um, and so imposing those mechanisms on everybody ends up uh, leaving some people worse off than they were before the mechanism was was introduced. Uh, I think that I think that is the primary reason why in practice we don't we don't go beyond the voting mechanism. Good point. So we um Skipping a little bit here, Arrow's possibility theorem is one of the most famous and discussed. So what's your take on it? Well, Ar Arrow is actually my, my teacher. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> and his, uh, his impossibility theorem had uh, was one of the reasons I got into the field in the first place. And I thought it was a, a fascinating and important piece of work. Uh, of course, it, it, it has been remarkably influential and and uh, guiding our thoughts about election mechanisms and uh, mechanisms more more generally. However, uh, in some of my recent work, and in fact, in a seminar I'm going to give here later today. I'm very much excited for that. Yes. I am going to uh, take issue with one particular axiom. What, what Arrow did was to say, suppose we want a voting system to satisfy certain axioms, certain requirements. Uh, what he showed was that some uh, ostensibly reasonable natural axioms were mutually incompatible. Mm -hmm. He got an impossibility theorem. Um, I'm going to argue, however, that one of those axioms in particular uh, is actually stronger 
behind the purpose for which Arrow wanted to use it. It accomplishes the purpose, but in a in too heavy-handed a way, oh. stronger than necessary for uh, for that purpose. And if instead you relax the axiom so that it's no longer overly strong, the impossibility theorem changes into a positive result. Oh, and and you get a you get a um, a voting system um, which does satisfy the axioms at least with this with this modification. So, uh, in answer to your question, uh, my my take on the theorem on Arrow's theorem is that it's tremendously important and influential, um, but it's not. Uh, the out improvements. Oh, perfect. So we're running very close on time here, but I'll, I'll see how much time I can get in here. So as a final tree, hopefully future Nobel laureates, <laughs> I'd like to know what's the most, most important thing you learned in your childhood. In my childhood. Um, I... I guess it, it, it was um, some, some notion of what uh, of what my basic interests are and what my and what my talents are. Mm -hmm. um, I was given the opportunity to to try to try out lots of things, and and that was, I, I think, a, a good a good childhood because uh, I figured out what I what I like to do. No, perfect. What's the most surprising thing that happened after you got the Nobel Prize? <laughs> well, I, I I'd had uh, lots of funny experiences. Um, one of them was um, I was I was approached by a comedian oh. uh, who wanted to use me as a sort of prop in her in her act oh uh, <laughs> she would she would make uh, jokes about uh, the economy, about uh, uh, about economics, and I would be there to uh, provide her with some material. Oh, so I I did this on stage. On stage, wow! Once, once that way about. <laughs> so that that, that was brave. <laughs> It was it was okay. She was she was um, she she uh, she was not hostile to me. Oh, that's good. Uh, and and um, it, it was fun. So, but it was it was not something that I ever anticipated would happen. So uh, <laughs> that's 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 a small example of the sort of thing that uh, that I could never have predicted. So so you're. You get the Nobel Prize in economics and you end up as a drama major. That's still perfectly, and that's perfect. So last question, I'm going to join these two together. I know you're, we're out of time, but so what do you think the state of economic science is today and what's your advice for your economists? In relation to that? No. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I, I would say that the state is actually pretty good in the sense that uh, we have made real progress in the, in the time that I've been in the profession. Uh, that we're actually in a better position now than when I was young mm -hmm. to um, to answer big questions. It's partly because the subject has uh, has more 
intellectual tools than it had, but it also because we have better access to data mm -hmm. now than we did, and we also have access to powerful data processing mm -hmm. tools such as computers, machine learning. Uh, so all of that is, uh, has made the subjects more powerful. Uh, and my advice to young economists is, uh, well, it's connected to my answer, um, what about my childhood, which is uh, uh, try to figure out what you like doing and, 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 then, and then do it. Uh, there's no point in going into economics, or at least the research point of economics, if all you're doing is answering other people's questions. So try to figure out what questions you want to answer and then, um, and then answer them, but uh, make sure it's your agenda and not someone else's agenda. What a beautiful answer. Thank you so much for taking time to be on the show. It's a great honor. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with us exploring the history of economic thought. You are welcome to email comments and suggestions to stefan at cpas.dk. Please like and share and recommend this podcast anywhere you can and think it's relevant. Until next time, stay rational. Yeah.